very happy to present uh, uh, this paper, which is on platform liability and innovation is a paper with my great quarters, uh, De Xinjiang and uh, Yassine Lefouli, who are also in the audience. So they may also help me with questions. If I'm not able to see the chat box at some point. So let me try to motivate what uh, is the main uh, topic of this presentation and why we think this is important. So e-commerce platforms uh, in recent years have become quite important. We buy e goods uh, online on platforms like Amazon, eBay, and many others. Uh, but in recent years, uh, something problematic has happened. According to ICD, the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Development, e-commerce platforms have become uh, ideal storefronts for counterfeits not only because they allow large numbers of potential customers to buy goods, but also because some of the sellers that are operating on this platform can sell goods from everywhere in the world and can be very hard to identify or uh, to bring to court. And uh, the problem has become particularly important in recent years with multiple brands uh, uh, filling uh, lawsuits against companies like Amazon and eBay is because they wanted, they were claiming that platforms were not doing enough to prevent the sale of counterfeited items on, on, on these platforms. And at some point, the big brands like Nike and Birkenstock decided to pull their products from the platform. Uh, there is also a very interesting uh, case that um, uh, concerned um, a luxury brand in uh, uh, in, in Europe, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, Louboutin, that was complaining for the presence of uh, hype infringing products on Amazon. And according to, uh, to courts, Amazon was not found li liable for uh, the sale of these uh, uh, this hype infringing products. Now, the overarching issue that we try to tackle with this um, uh, paper is whether platform sh platforms should be held liable for third parties illegal uh, illegal conduct, the third party's misconduct. And currently, digital platforms uh, that are intermediaries uh, benefit uh, to a large extent uh, from liability exemption. This is certainly the case in uh, the US with Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, but it is also the case uh, with some uh, small differences uh, with the e-commerce directive in the European Union. Platforms in the European Union benefit from uh, liability exemption, as long as uh, they uh, comply, they are considered, the, they are passive, and at the same time, they act immediately the moment they become aware of illegal conduct that is uh, present on their ecosystem. But in recent years, uh, policy attention uh, uh, increased on this topic, and we now have uh, the European Digital Services Act that was approved by the European Parliament last week, we have um, other piece of regulation that have been drafted in the UK, the UK Online Safety Bill, the Informed Consumers Act in the US, and a new law in China that uh, try to intervene on this topic by granting platforms some liability exemption, updating the current liability regime for some platforms, introducing, in some cases, some strict liability. So the, the, in this paper, what we are going to focus on is, um, first of all, uh, on a specific type of platforms, e-commerce platforms, and eventually app stores, and a specific type of illegal misconduct, IPR infringements. So we are gonna be uh, focusing on trademark violation, design violation, and copyright. And it is very important that what I'm gonna say now, these infringement are by non-deceptive third parties. So there is um, the products that are sold in our, that, that are considered in our model are sold by uh, copycats, but these products are neither harmful nor deceptive in the sense that consumers know that buying not from uh, the original seller means buying a low quality version. There is no deception. And uh, the absence of um, Asymmetric information is also part, quite important in our framework because uh, imagine a situation in which you buy something that you think uh, is an original product, and then this is delivered to your own place. Then uh, in most countries and also most platforms adopt this policy, you can simply return it back. 
So if there is a mismatch, a mismatch between what you thought you were buying and what you get in the end. So it also makes sense to focus on non-deceptive third parties. And a leading example is the one that I have in this slide. So you may imagine, for example, a branded product, Levi's, and a copycat, Love. Now for the consumers, these products are really different. They look similar, but the consumer can perfectly understand that buying Love means not buying Levi's. So there is some, some, some differentiation here. Now, with this in mind, in this paper, we are going to answer this narrower question, which is what is the impact of making platforms liable for IP infringements by third parties on innovation and on consumers? And we are going to focus on the following negligence liability rule. So we are going to focus on the case in which lawmakers, policymakers, regulators, impose some requirements that platforms have to comply with in order to benefit from liability exemption, the current safe harbor. And in our model, this means that platforms have to comply with a minimum screening requirement and the obligation to delist any, any IP infringing product that they identify on the marketplace. And the second part of this um, uh, negligence rule that we are focusing on is pretty much very is pretty much similar to the current e-commerce the current provision of the e-commerce directive that tells that platforms have to immediately in, uh, intervene the moment they become aware of illegal conduct illegal products or illegal information that is present on the marketplaces now with this, we try to contribute to the law and economics literature on liability, mostly to the literature on indirect liability. When you want to make a party that is not directly involved in, in illegal activity, liable for third parties, illegal activities. And more importantly, on the topic of liability in digital markets, there are some formal contributions, but there are most importantly two closely related paper very two, two fascinating papers. One uh, is by uh, Xinju, my discussion. Uh, I'm very grateful for, uh, for being here. And by Catherine Spear uh, is a paper that was presented actually in this seminar series a couple of weeks ago that concerns uh, liability in the presence of harmful products. And there is also another fascinating paper by Alessandro De Chiara, Esther Manna, and co authors. Uh, on liability for hosting platforms in the presence of copyright violation. But this is a seminar on platform governance. Uh, and this paper tried to speak to the community of platforms uh, because in the end, the, the decision of a platform to delist um, IP infringing products uh, is a decision concerning the governance of a platform. And platforms um, use different prices pricing and unpricing instruments to influence, for example, vendors' competition and innovation. They may bias innovation towards one side of the market, curate the ecosystem, or the leaks of to toxic content. And in one of the extensions that we have, we also focus on uh, the interplay between uh, the imposition of platform liability and the adoption of a hybrid business model, and many papers that I'm uh, referring to have also been presented in this seminar series. Now, um, if there are no questions, uh, I will start uh, presenting the details of the model that we have in mind. So consider an economy in which all transactions between sellers and buyers uh, take place on a marketplace, on a monopoly platform. And there are two types of sellers. We have innovators that can develop an original product. And uh, this has a cost which is distributed, a fixed cost of innovation that is distributed according to a CDFF and a PDF small f. And the moment uh, an innovator develops an innovation, a new product, this gives rise to a new product category. And for simplicity, we are gonna assume that the marginal cost of production are equal to zero. Now in each product category, a single imitator copies the innovative product at no cost. And now with the probability new, this imitation is legitimate. 
And with the complementary probability, this imitation is infringing IPRs. Now, in the baseline model, we assume that this probability is exogenous. But we have an extension, uh, depending on time, I can spend some words uh, about it. Uh, we also consider the case in which uh, there is endogenous decision by imitators to be infringing, uh, to infringe IPRs or not. And the presence of this endogeneity is particularly important because it gives rise to some additional interesting effect. Now, the platform sets an ad valorem commission rate, which is tall on the seller side uh, of the market, and is committing to a screening effort, phi. And phi is the probability that an IP infringer is identified. Now, two things are very important here. First, uh, the, we are considering uh, uh, a commitment uh, on screening effort. Uh, in an extension, we also consider what happens in the absence of commitment, but we thought it is reasonable to assume that there is commitment because nowadays, very large platforms are subject to transparency obligations. So there is some observability in what they are doing in terms of moderation, in terms of screening. And the second is that the technology adopted by the platform is imperfect. So the higher the screening effort, the higher is the probability that an IP infringing product is identified. Now, the moment an IP infringing product is identified, it can be delisted by the platform. However, legitimate imitators cannot be delisted by the platform. And one reason could be, for example, that there is a platform to business regulation, like in the European Union, for which platforms uh, are obliged to ensure some fair treatment to legitimate sellers. We assume that screening is costly, increasingly costly, so there is a complex function here, uh, which automatically implies that uh, if a platform is investing in screening, uh, is uh, increasing its screening effort and identifies an IP infringing product, then uh, it has an incentive to delist it. So we can think about phi as the probability that uh, uh, there is uh, the identification and the listing of an IP infringing product. Now, the last um, agent in our model, the last set of agents is, uh, uh, are the buyers. We consider a mass one of buyers. In the baseline model, we assume that all buyers join the marketplace. Now, then later, and this is the core part actually of the paper, we focus on the case in which there is elastic buyer participation, which is particularly important because it's, it's the way we model the presence of cross-group network effects. Buyers are ex-ante symmetric. They have the same ex-ante utility from joining the platform, but they are exposed asymmetric. They discover their valuations for innovators and imitators once on the platform. Now, in each product category, each product category that is there because uh, an innovator generated a new product and this uh, gave rise to a new product category. Now, each product category is uh, by default duopolistic. There is the innovator and the imitator, but can become monopolistic because uh, the platform can identify an IP infringing products and they list it. So in this case, the product category becomes monopolistic. In each product category, the innovator is getting pi IM or pi ID, depending on whether the product category is monopolistic or duopolistic. The only assumption that we make here is that monopolistic profits are larger than duopolistic profits. Then imitators, obtain pi CD if they are not delisted. And here we model vertical differentiation. So pi CD is lower than pi ID. It makes sense to consider indeed the situation for which innovators make uh, um, profit that are higher when they are alone in the, market, in the product category than we are competing with the innovators and branded products and innovators are different in terms of value. And therefore, they, give, they, uh, they generate asymmetric profits. 
Now, consumers obtain ex ante utility, which is UM if the product category is monopolistic or UD if the product category is dualistic. And given that we are considering IP infringing products that are not, uh, that are uh, neither harmful nor uh, deceptive, we assume that uh, consumers prefer to gain more utility. The, the ex ante utility for a consumer is higher in a, a dualistic market structure. Now, the timing is the following. The platform is setting its screening effort and the commission rate tau. Second, innovators, um, having observed these terms and conditions of the platform, make their innovation decisions and join the marketplace, join the platform if they innovate. In each product category, a single imitator joins the platform and is delisted if it infringes IPRs and is identified with probability five. And finally, buyers decide whether to join the platform. In the baseline model, we start uh, with a situation in which all buyers are on the platform. So there is an elastic demand for the buyer participation. And upon joining the platform, they discover their evaluations for the products and they make the purchasing decision in each product category. Now, it's important here to clarify what are the expected payoffs of the sellers and the buyers. So for a given screening effort, uh, an innovator's expected gross profit is just a weighted average of uh, the profit uh, an innovator would get uh, if there is a monopolistic uh, uh, industry structure per category structure, and the profit he would get uh, if there is a dualistic uh, dual structure. So one minus new is the probability that there is a IP infringing product is phi and phi is the probability that uh, an IP infringing product is identified. The expected per category profit of an imitator is just uh, uh, dependent on the, on the probability that uh, the imitator is not delisted, either because it is infringing IPRs and it is not identified or because it is legitimate. And the expected utility per category of a buyer is once again a weighted average of the utility obtained if there is a monopolistic market structure and if there is a dualistic market structure. Now, let me start introducing the baseline model. And um, we are gonna focus, we're gonna start with um, inelastic buyer participation. All buyers are on the marketplace. All buyers are on the platform. And we assume for now that there is an exogenous commission rate. Now you can think about an exogenous commission rate um, as um, the result of a long run decision strategy of a platform that uh, uh, decides about the commission rate or simply as a situation for which uh, for the platform is quicker, it's easier to adjust uh, the screening effort uh, than uh, the commission rate. Alternatively, you can think about uh, an exogenous commission rate being there because uh, there is ex ante or ex post regulation, for example, by competition policy that prohibits uh, excessive pricing, or alternatively, because uh, there is uh, a direct channel that puts a constraint on how much uh, a platform can charge innovators if the reservation utility of the innovators is sufficiently large. Then we are going to relax this assumption. But uh, let's focus now on uh, what the platform would do in a laissez-faire regime. And this is part particularly important because one of the complaints made by brand owners is that platforms do not have incentives to screen and delist IP infringers. Now, in, in this setting, we, we, we're going to identify whether or not there are these incentives, and then we focus on uh, the impact of platform liability. Now, uh, in the LSFA regime, the number of innovators uh, that in the second stage develop a new product and join the platform is just a probability. It's the probability that the net expected profit of an innovator 
is larger than its innovation cost that is fixed. And pi i phi is the expected gross profit that we've seen before. But then uh, the innovator has to pay a commission to the platform. So this gives us an i, which is uh, the number of innovators, but also the number of product categories because innovators uh, give rise to new product categories. And the expected profit of a platform that the platform maximizes by choosing the screening effort is the following. So here we have the screening cost, omega, and uh, the revenues are the commission rate that is charged on the NI uh, product categories. And in each product category, the platform is collecting uh, a portion because we are considering the commission rate uh, of uh, the per category total profit, which is basically the sum of the expected profit of an innovator and the expected profit of its copycat. Now, in the laissez faire regime, the platform decides uh, uh, phi, the screening effort, to maximize its, this expected profit, uh, taking into account. Uh, two main effects for a given cost. The fact that increasing phi impacts positively on the number of product categories in this baseline model, because by increasing the screening effort, the platform is reducing the probability that each product category is duopolistic. Therefore, it is increasing the expected profit of an innovator. And therefore, it gives more incentives to innovators to develop new product. And therefore, we have a higher number of product categories. So in the baseline model, this effect is always positive. And we are going to call it later IP protection effect. But there is also another effect that the platform takes into account, which is the effect on increasing screening effort on the per category expected total profit. And this effect can be positive or negative. And that depends on whether a monopolistic market structure gives a higher total profit than a duopolistic market structure. And it is negative otherwise. And the two scenarios are present and can be microfounded in different ways. Now, in the laissez faire regime, therefore, if total profits are greater under a monopolistic industry structure than a duopolistic industry structure, the two effects are positive and the platform optimal screening effort is always positive. So there is an incentive for the platform to identify and the list IP infringing products. If, it was not, if the platform was, were not constrained by the cost of screening, and by the possibility to screen out uh, legitimate, uh, the impossibility to screen out uh, legitimate uh, imitators, the platform would have the interest in screening, in removing all imitators. Otherwise, if uh, a duopolistic industry structure gives rise to higher total profits than a monopolistic one, the optimal screening effort of the platform may even be zero, no screening at all. So the platform incentives to engage in screening tend to be higher if total profits are maximized under the monopolistic industry structure. But now let's focus on what happens if you impose platform liability. And we focus on the case in which uh, um, the regulator, the, the lawmaker imposes a minimum screening requirement uh, that are higher than uh, the privately optimal level by star decided by the platform owner. And we focus on the case in which the platform finds it optimal to comply um, with this uh, screening, uh, minimum screening requirement. And you can think about, uh, about it in two ways. First of all, uh, litigation costs can be very high and therefore the platform has an incentive to comply or alternatively, there might be fines for non-compliance. So long story short, platform liability here means that 
the platform has to increase its screening effort. Now, this is going to lead, to lead in the very baseline model to the following effect on innovation. And this is the intended effect of platform liability on innovation. By increasing screening effort, the platform reduces the probability that each product category is localistic. It relaxes competition between the, the imitators and the innovators. This increases the expected profit of an innovator. And therefore, this leads to a positive effect on innovation. But what is the effect on consumers in the baseline model? Now, consumer surplus uh, is given by the number of product categories uh, and the per category utility that each consumer obtains. And so here, platform liability has two opposite effects on consumer surplus. The first one is that, is that uh, it leads to more innovation, therefore more product categories. But at the same time, it is rendering each product category monopolistic, more likely to be monopolistic, and therefore per category utility decreases. So depending on the relative magnitude of the different effects, the net effect can be positive or negative, and this boils down to a comparison of two different semi-elasticities. The semi-elasticity of the amount of innovation and the semi-elasticity of the per category utility. And the net effect is positive, if consumer benefit more from an increase in the number of product categories than how much they are losing in each single product category because there is less competition. Taking a message is that platform liability in this baseline model benefits consumers if the effect on innovation is sufficiently strong. But let's start now relaxing the assumption of inelastic buyer participation. And this is particularly important because it's a way to introduce cross-group network effects. And we are gonna focus now on two different types of cross-group network effects. A cross-group network effects that goes from buyers to innovators and cross-group network effects that go that go in, 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 uh, in both directions, from buyers to innovators and from innovators to buyers. In order to generate these uh, two different types of uh, uh, cross-group network effects, uh, it is useful to write down the utility of a consumer that joins the platform, which is basically given by how many product categories are present times uh, the utility in a given product category, now here, this is particularly important. This is uh, uh, the gamma here is a category related, related opportunity cost. So for each product category that is present, uh, the consumer has to incur an opportunity cost. You can think about time spent in order to understand uh, uh, each product category. And this is also quite in line with the recent literature. And then gamma, uh, Xi here, represents a platform related opportunity cost, an opportunity cost that uh, is born in order to join the marketplace, in order to join the platform. We are gonna focus now first on the case in which there are only one-sided cross-group network effects. So there is no platform related opportunity cost. And this is quite in line with the recent paper by Andre Aju, Tata Uthé, and Julian Wright in RAND. So there is a, a per category outside option in their model. In our case, it's the opportunity cost that is category specific. And therefore, the consumer decision to join the platform only depends on how much, surf, how much utility the consumer obtains by joining a, a product category and the opportunity cost. So it does not depend on the number of innovators. It does not depend on the number of product categories. So there are no network effects from innovators to buyers, but there are network effects from buyers to innovators because depending on this relationship, we obtain the demand. And the demand is going to be the probability that the utility in a given product category is larger than the opportunity cost. Now, the key aspect here 
is that the demand of buyers is decreasing in the screening platform. And the reason is that each buyer decides to join the platform depending on how much surplus it gets. And if you screen more, at the least more IP infringers, you render the, market, the, the product category more likely to be duopolistic, uh, to, to be uh, monopolistic. And therefore, this reduces the participation of users, of buyers. Now, the reason why we have one-sided cross-group network effects is that uh, the demand is taken into account by innovators when deciding to develop an innovative product and sell it uh, via the platform. And so here, platform liability, differently from the baseline model, has now two effects on innovation. The first one is what we have seen before, the positive IP protection effect. I screen more, I get rid more, uh, I get rid, uh, uh, more, I'm more likely to get rid of uh, uh, competitors of uh, uh, innovators, and therefore I induce innovators to invest in innovative products. But uh, there is an effect that is negative that is stemming from the reduction in buyer participation. And therefore, the net effect is positive or negative depending on the prevailing effect. Also in this case, we can write down the relationship between these two effects in terms of same elasticities. But the take of message is that platform liability can now lead to less innovation, which is a very important result given that platform liability is meant to protect innovators. Now, platform liability has therefore two effects on consumer surplus. There is a change in the number of product categories as before, but now the number of product categories can decrease because innovation can decrease. And in each product, in each product category, the utility decreases. So this implies that uh, when we look at uh, the prevailing effect, the net effect is positive if the relationship holds, but now differently from before, this effect, uh, this relationship might not be, um, uh, may fail to be too old because uh, the number of innovators can actually decrease with platform liability. So in this case, there are conditions under which platform liability harm consumers, and platform liability harms consumers if its impact on innovation is either negative or moderately positive, otherwise it is going to benefit consumers. Now, let's focus now on the other case where there are two-sided cross-group network effects. So this basically means that we put to zero the category-related opportunity cost, and we focus on the platform opportunity cost. Now, buyers decide to join the platform, taking into account how much surplus is created, the utility generated in each product category, but also the number of product categories. And if you increase the number of product categories, you are more likely to increase buyer participation. So now, given that, um, uh, so there is a coordination problem here. So the number of innovators and that of buyers are given by the following expression. So we need to look for a fixed point. And we, when we do so, we identify conditions under which uh, buyer participation increases or decreases with a higher screening effort. So this implies that uh, platform liability has two effects on innovation once again. The usual positive intended, uh, what actually is meant to, to generate platform liability, and this is the IP protection effect, but there are also two, uh, there, is, there is another effect that can be positive or negative. And this is coming from the change in buyer participation and the net effect, therefore, of platform liability on innovation is positive is if buyer participation increases or does not decrease too much, but is negative otherwise. And the net effect on consumer surplus has the same sign as the effect on buyer participation. This is to tell you that the presence of cross-group network effects is particularly important in order to identify the impact 
of platform liability on innovation and consumers, but the presence of network effects from, but also the, the, the direction is particularly important. The presence of network effects that go from innovators to buyers tends to make platform liability more likely to benefit innovators and consumers. Now, let us relax the other assumption that we have made at the very beginning. Uh, we've assumed that uh, the commission rate uh, was exogenous. Now, let us suppose that the platform decides also about the commission rate. And um, we are interested uh, in understanding how does uh, inducing the platform to screen uh, more to increase its screening effort impacts the marginal benefit from an increase in the commission rate. And in order for, in order to answer this question, we need to identify what, what, what is the trade-off that the platform has to deal with when deciding about the commission rate. Now, the platform, when deciding the commission rate takes into account two opposite effects. If increases the commission rate, it gets more uh, from uh, more revenues in each product category. So this is the intensive margin effect, but it also reduces the number of product categories. So this is an extensive margin effect. And it turns out that uh, if you screen, if you use the platform to invest more in a screening effort, uh, then a change in the screening effort impacts both effects. And the impact on the intensive margin depends on the elasticity of the CDF. And the impact of the extensive margin depends on the elasticity of the PDF. And so we can write conditions for which platform liability leads to an increase in the commission rate. And so this is a, a quite intuitive result. You may think about the fact that if you have to screen more, if you need to spend more effort, this is costly for you. And then you want to recoup the resources that you have uh, uh, spent by increasing the commission rate. But interestingly, and also quite surprisingly, uh, we find that uh, platform liability might lead to a reduction in the commission rate. So the platform reacts by lowering the commission rate in order to stimulate more innovators participation to uh, to the platform and therefore enlarging the number of product categories that are present. So what is going to be now the impact on innovation, given that we are interested on the impact of platform liability? Now we have the usual uh, IP protection effect that is positive, but now the platform reacts by changing the commission rate. So if more screening means that the platform lowers the commission rate, there is a new positive effect of platform liability on innovation. So platform liability, effect, positive effects on innovation are amplified because there is a new channel and this is therefore also more likely to benefit consumers. On the other hand, if more screening leads to a change in the commission rate that is now higher, this generates a new negative effect of platform liability on innovation. But what we show in the paper is that uh, this indirect uh, effect, uh, the margin effect, uh, is lower than uh, the positive effect, uh, the, the positive IP protection effect, as long as the second one, the, the former one is, uh, is negative. And therefore, the net effect remains positive. Innovation continues to increase with platform liability, but to a lower extent. Now, let me tell you very quickly what we also do in the paper. And we try first to identify new channels through which platform liability can affect innovation and consumers. First, we focus on the case in which um, um, the infringement is endogenous. So imagine a situation in which uh, you have imitators that have to decide whether to infringe or to be legitimate. And imagine a situation in which uh, being infringer is cheaper. Now, if you introduce platform liability, under some conditions, you have the same results as now. Under some other conditions, and this is um, an interesting effect, you induce 
potential IP infringers to become legitimate. But this can have a negative effect on innovation because uh, the, the legitimate sellers cannot be removed by the platform. And so if platform liability increases, in in increases this conversion, it is more likely to render each product category duopolistic and this exert competitive pressure on innovators that might decide to invest less on innovation. The second extension that we consider is the hybrid business model. You can imagine a scenario in which there is a pure marketplace like the one we have considered now, but also the platform. And this is, and in this case, platform liability certainly harms the platform because it's forcing the platform to do something that is suboptimal. So, so suboptimal. On the other hand, the platform that adopts a hybrid business model, if it is forced to, um, to, delete, to identify and the least IP infringers that identifies, can still restore a duopolistic market structure by introducing its own uh, legitimate copycats. And so platform liability here means that the platform is more likely to change from a pure marketplace to a hybrid one. And finally, the third extension that we consider is the absence of commitment. Platform liability can mitigate the old up, have the platform to commit, and therefore increase the platform profits. Now it's time to wrap up. So with this paper, we try to look at uh, the potential unintended effects on of platform liability, where platform liability implies uh, a higher screening effort by the platform on innovation and consumer surface. And we find that these unintended effects come from the impact that platform liability has on buyer participation and on the commission rate. So these unintended effects can either be positive or negative. So if buyer participation decreases and we find conditions under which this is possible, then this may lead to less innovation and lower consumer surplus. But there are also positive unintended effects that come from, for example, from the case in which the platform reacts by changing, reacts to platform liability by changing the commission rate, reducing the commission rate, this spurs more innovation and leads to a higher consumer surplus. And we also find that um, it is important not only to understand the relevance of cross-group network effects, because results can change dramatically, but it's very important also to consider the direction of these network effects. And the cross-group network effects from innovators to buyers crucially affect the desirability of platform, of, of platform liability. And in particular, if these effects are strong enough, then platform liability is more likely to induce more innovation to benefit innovators and also consumers. Otherwise, there are cases in which platform liability leads to, uh, le to a lower consumer surplus, therefore harming consumers, and in some cases, uh, might even harm innovators, which is uh, basically what policymakers don't want because the idea of introducing platform liability in this scenario in which uh, uh, the online misconduct comes from the presence of IP infringing products is probably to protect uh, innovation. Thanks a lot for your attention and I really look forward to your comments and discussion. Uh, thanks very much, Leonardo. So let's go straight to um, Xin Yu for the discussion. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I still have one slide. I know it's not must, so let me... Uh share my slide. Okay. All right, so uh, I very much enjoy reading this paper and uh, uh, I think it's a very nice uh, piece of study uh, which covers uh, some important topic with very interesting policy implications. Now, uh, okay, as Leonardo mentions, uh, this paper certainly contributes to the literature about law and economics as well as the one on platforms. Uh, 
Uh, but besides those, I think it also uh, complements the literature on IPR protection and piracy. Uh, actually, Kathy and I, we also have another paper about piracy, but totally different. So uh, we know there in that literature, there are some studies showing that sometimes accommodating piracy can actually uh, increase brand owners' profits, which in turn may promote uh, innovation. And we have seen here uh, when uh, there are margin effects in this current paper, sometimes the uh, lower screening efforts at the platform may also uh, increase the number of innovations. So in that regard, uh, it can actually uh, also contribute to that literature on IPR protection. I think some discussions along this line would be uh, kind of useful. And also this paper identified many interesting uh, and subtle effects. Okay, as we have heard, there could be IP protection effects versus the monopoly distortion within each category. Also there could be demand effects, okay, due to the buyers, the changes of buyers participation. And finally the margin effects, which is very interesting. And my comments are mostly about potential extensions and maybe a further analysis. So uh, we see that, uh, first of all, if there's no regulation or liability, while the paper derives the platform's optimal screening efforts, okay, uh, which is intuitive, and we saw the intuition, uh, but it's not clear to me uh, what the socially optimal screen level should be and whether the private level is socially excessive or insufficient. Okay, uh, I think the answer to this question will be useful, especially when we think about for such negligence based rules, liability rules or regulation, while the social planner in choosing uh, Phi Theta may need uh, uh, such kind of information, right? Okay. And related to the first comments, uh, I think it'd be uh, also useful to have more welfare analysis. So currently the analysis focuses on the impact on innovation and consumer surplus, okay, which is useful. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I'm wondering uh, what would be the total uh, welfare changes okay, when there's regulation, the minimum screening requirements. Uh, I know given so many subtle effects, it's kind of hard to derive general conditions, uh, but perhaps it's useful to provide some numerical examples to illustrate the effects. Uh, for example, I really like this uh, final margin effect. Okay, and we know that uh, when uh, with uniform distribution, okay, the commission rate is independent of the platform screen effort. Okay, but I was wondering, could there be any uh, other familiar distributions under which uh, the commission rate increases or decreases in screen efforts? I think having those numeric examples may give us uh, more uh, policy or welfare implications. And then uh, for potential extensions, uh, the current paper, uh, okay, consider the platform's action to verify IPR uh, violations. But I was wondering sometimes in practice, maybe brand owners might be in better position to do so given their expertise or knowledge about products. If that's the case, we may have a kind of a double-sided more hazard uh, framework. And also I was thinking about the pricing schemes. I saw there were some uh, discussions in the chat box about the commission rate. So currently, uh, I think the margin effects uh, part, uh, partly depends on this assumption that the platform can only charge a uniform commission rate for all the uh, firms. So, uh, and the, the paper also provides some discussions about price discrimination. Uh, I was wondering uh, what happens if the platform could set commission rates based on market structure. Uh, I'm not sure whether we see this in practice, but you know, theoretically it's possible. For example, the monopolist and duopolist, they may pay different commission rates. So it seemed to me in that case, uh, the regulation or liability could be more uh, desirable. Okay. Or alternatively, we may think about the, uh, the flat fee for each transaction, per transaction fee, instead of uh, a percentage fee uh, based on profit or revenue. Okay. Uh, and also finally, I think this is, uh, well, the, currently the screen costs are fixed costs. So I was also wondering uh, what would happen if part of the screen costs are variable. Right? So okay, currently the, the screen costs are independent of the number of categories or the number of firms. Okay? Uh, but perhaps some of the screen costs could be per firm. So in that case, maybe some of the welfare effects would be different. Now, I mean, all this, uh, most of the comments are about for, uh, future extensions, but again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I really 
like the study, and I think this, uh, there must be a lot of follow-up and related studies in this direction. Thank you.